I think part of the um, approach of the delegitimizers is this idea of having lots of little lies that eventually build up to a big lie and a, narr and a narrative. But I also want to say that there are some audiences for which the approach of trying to correct them on the facts just doesn't work. And I sometimes feel like when we talk about Hasbara, it has its place and correcting the lies are very important. And I don't want to be misunderstood about that. But there are some people for whom when you say the word Hasbara, when you say the word, I'm going to correct what you think about this issue, you've lost them already. Hasbara, if you wanted to be cynical, essentially says, the reason why you don't understand Israel's legitimacy is because you haven't sat down and listened to me talk to you for long enough. Sit down, shut up, and I'm going to speak to you. And if there's a problem here, it is with your understanding and your comprehension. And that approach, I think, in some places, and especially on campus, risks being seen as patronizing. Now, that doesn't mean that there, the effort isn't important. And there are many audiences and people, I think it's important to understand, people formulate their opinions about things in different ways. Some people have the integrity and the honesty to look at a situation, be confronted with facts that are more compelling and say, you know what, I'll now think differently about that. I heard what Yossi said about Harry Truman. And now I actually think, wow, that's a, I, was, I was sold, you know, uh, something ridiculous. But other people will not listen to facts, regardless of how compelling they are. And sometimes I think that it's important to make a distinction with respect to those audiences. When the, um, when the Mavi Mamara took place, when the flotilla incident took place, I had this image of all of the pro-Israel world standing by their computers or fax machines waiting to get talking points so that they could become experts on the law of the sea overnight. So that they would know in their talking points why what Israel did was okay because they'd be able straight away when they were at their office and someone said, damn, you know what those Israelis did? I can't believe them. And they would go, wait a second. According to Article 161 of the Law of the Sea Convention, Israel is actually entitled to interdict a vessel in the open seas in those circumstances. And they would go, Maya, how did you become an expert in the Law of the Sea? Incredible. So there, there's that model of trying to help legitimize and combat the delegitimizers with facts. But I think there's another model which is just as important. And that's a model that is based, I think, on values. And based on sharing the kind of values which shape the decisions we make. The distinction I would make is the difference between being an advocate for Israel and being a character witness for Israel. Right? An advocate for Israel is someone who has the arguments in front of them to make the case. And very often, the very fact that you have advocate written on your forehead means that someone's not going to listen to you. A character witness does something else. A character witness says, you know what? I know those Israelis. Now, they may not get it right every time. But I've met Israelis, I've spoken to them, I know the dilemmas that country faces, and I know that they bring to those dilemmas a set of values that the Western world shares. Yes, we can have an argument about the facts and to how to solve this problem, but connect to people at the level of their values and their emotions before you do it at the level of fact. And I think you'll find if you think, if you think about yourselves and how you shaped your own opinions about things, right? We like to think that we form our opinions rationally. We like to think that we're made an argument and we are persuaded. But if you follow any of the research about this lately, you know how much there are irrational and subconscious factors at play. You form your opinion because of the story you tell yourself about who you are. If you're Jewish, you form your opinion because of what your mother thinks of you, right? because of your social circle and so on. And unless you can cast Israel's case and the legitimacy of Israel's cause within a person's framework, both their subconscious and their conscious framework, just the factual argument may not do it. 
There's one point I wanted to make, and I think it's very important, because perhaps one of the first steps for dealing with delegitimization is believing in our own legitimacy. And believing in our own legitimacy means that for the Jewish world to speak to itself and tap into the values, not just the facts, but the values that have made us make the decisions that we make and address the dilemmas that we face. Second point, I wanted to speak specifically about something which I imagine Yossi and Mike, Yossi didn't refer to, and Mike, I'll spare him of, and that's a, a specific delegitimization challenge which concerns us a great deal, and that's the International Criminal Court. So I won't bore you with too much legalese, but the, the challenge of the International Criminal Court is potentially a very significant one. As a result of the General Assembly resolution where the Palestinians acquired non-member state status in the United Nations, uh, there are those who believe that Palestine is now eligible to, to join the International Criminal Court. We dispute that assessment, uh, legally certainly. We also think it's a tragic mistake for them to make. But I wanted to describe a little bit what the court is and what the challenge is faced by the court. Assuming there is a situation where Palestine were to join the International Criminal Court, essentially what it does, potentially at least, gives the court jurisdiction over things that happen, at the very least, in some parts of the territory of the West Bank and Gaza. Now, we would argue, and the best Jewish minds would argue every point of this, but I think one of our concerns is what we call the shadow of this court would be cast across the region. This, I think, has several potential implications. And I want to make clear that there are some people who are very good at predicting exactly how dangerous a threat is. I didn't go to that university, right? It's hard to measure exactly. It's something that you'll only know if it happens, which we hope it doesn't, and we'll know we'll have to adapt to it and see the degree to which it's a threat. Potentially, I think it is far-reaching. One of the main problems with the ICC issue is, I think, the idea of simply the attempt to put Israel in the chair of the accused, and what a boost that would be to delegitimizers in general, to the entire BDS campaign, to be able to cast Israel in that light. A second thing, I think, is that with this risk of a criminal process, of criminal processes hanging over the Israeli-Palestinian relationship, I think you would fundamentally alter that relationship. It would suck the air out of any option for a political process, simply because I can't imagine an Israeli government that would be engaged in a process while a criminal, the, the sword of a criminal proceeding hang, hangs over its, its head. And I think, frankly, there's a real risk that it would be taken advantage of by terrorists who would try to draw Israeli soldiers into more and more complicated operations. We know the way they use civilians as human shields in an attempt to create that perception and bring the court in. We have unfortunately far too much experience of how international institutions are used against Israel. Uh, there is, um, you know, we have, I think, in our history, reason to worry whether judicial institutions will not go in the same, in the same direction. So it's, a, it's a, a, a danger that we're looking at very seriously. Um, and I think uh, one which, which um, which both the Justice Ministry and the Foreign Ministry and other elements of the, of the Israeli government are, are um, addressing. The final thing I wanted to say or just share with you is a couple of dilemmas that at least uh, I think are worth thinking about or for you to think about when we deal with the challenge of delegitimization. I'd be happy if Yossi and Mike uh, referred to this. I think one of the challenges in delegitimization is what I call the, the, the nuisance threat dilemma. Right? How much do you refer and treat delegitimization as a serious threat if by doing so you actually give oxygen to the people who are doing it? You make them feel like they are succeeding. Where if you treat it as a nuisance, you try to diminish its significance. The dilemma here is that on the one hand, you need to be ready and capable and rally people to be able to fight this fight where it's necessary, because as Yossi said, I think, you know, there are battles going on in all places, and, and to kind of be dismissive of this is dangerous. On the other hand, describing this as a great threat that Israel faces 
in our internal conversations, that's one thing. But speaking about it publicly in that way, I can think of few better gifts to someone who's engaged in this effort. And I think that's something that we need to think about. A second uh, dilemma or component of this is that some, of the t some people think that some of the tools that are used against Israel, Israel should use against its enemies. Right? I'll give you one example. We have a real challenge in some uh, courts of the idea of universal jurisdiction, the use of universal jurisdiction, which means using foreign courts to try to try uh, Israeli officials or ex-soldiers and so on. Now, Israel's core argument is that this is a fundamental misuse of legal fora. It's an abuse of legal fora. And it's a, an attempt to use law as a weapon and to export the conflict that needs to be resolved at the negotiating table to achieve cheap points. And on the one hand, you want the other side to feel that they are in danger. They, they, this is a double-edged sword. On the other hand, there's the danger that by using these same tools, you, you weaken your argument that this is an illegitimate method. And I think that's something that needs a little bit of attention. I'll just end with one, one last point. I've said this before when I, when I uh, have addressed you before, but it's, I think it's worth repeating. It, it sometimes bothers me when we speak about Israel and all the challenges it faces, it sounds like we created Israel in order to concentrate Jewish anxiety in one location. <laughs> and if what we did was take the Jew from Lodge and put him in Jerusalem, and instead of worrying about pogroms, gave him something else to worry about, but he's still just as worried, then I don't think we've done that switch of what Zionism is actually about. Right? Zionism is not just about having a sovereign state. It is also about having what I call a sovereign state of mind. And a sovereign state of mind means that as a people, we should be in the business of broadcasting confidence in our capacity to deal with any of the challenges we face. We have to be vigilant. We shouldn't diminish any of these threats. But we shouldn't be that worried you know, Jew in the corner saying, who's coming to get me now? Because we are here and we're not going anywhere and we have the tools at our disposal to deal with what they're throwing at us now and what they'll throw at us tomorrow. Thank you very much.